350 years ago, at this place, shots rang out from a firing squad. Despite being no more than 30 feet away, only one bullet found its mark. This was not due to any deficiencies in the power or accuracy of the 17th century musket. Ilium Doan, William Christian, collapsed. His ribs were broken and he was bleeding internally. He was taken in agony back to his house at Ronaldsway, where he died of his injuries nearly two hours later. Had this man been a sadistic murderer, it may have been possible to blind ourselves to such an unpleasant death, but he was not. Without any doubt, his actions in negotiating rather than being forced into surrender by English parliamentarians saved hundreds if not thousands of Manx lives and ensured this nation's ability to remain distinct. <laughs> the continued existence of Timwald can be directly attributed to this negotiated surrender. This being the case, we would expect his memory to be more respected, that his actions and subsequent murder would be part of the educational curriculum. Now, at that point, I am aware that there is a page on the Manx curriculum internet site about him. It's a bit different to teaching it as part of the curriculum. So, it is not. And I think it is fair to say that the only actions, only the actions of we who gather here today and have gathered for the past 32 years at this site have brought his memory back in a truer light. There is now an official acknowledgement in the, of his contribution, a stained glass window in the Tinwald building and a block of government officers bearing his name. But these small acknowledgements have been gained grudgingly. All too many in this island still seem to find his murder not only accept acceptable but justifiable and worse, right. These people will often describe Ilium Dawn as a slippery, treacherous, self-serving individual who only acted in pursuance of his own material best outcome. This description flies square in the face of recorded fact, and his conduct from arrest to execution is not that of a man whose primary concern was his own well-being. Those who prefer the black history rely on the received wisdom passed down from those who, in turn, rely upon Victorian fiction for their education, by which I mean the work of Anglo-Scottish fantasist, romantic fantasist, Walter Scott. The second edition of his fiction, Peril of the Peak, carried an apology to the Christian family for his defamation of their ancestor, but that is conveniently ignored. Ilium Doan's actions were known, understood, and acknowledged by the Manx people of the time. The core verses of the ballad, Bears Ilium Dawn, were written and sung in the Manx language in the years immediately after his murder. This would not have happened if he was not known and respected by his contemporary Manxmen. Yet the myth of Ilium Dawn as an untrustworthy flip-flopper has firmly taken hold since the publication of Walter Scott's fantasy novels. Why? It would not serve a colonising power to allow the colonised to have a unifying focus. Our own language, our own identity. We might want our own rights. We might want our internationally recognised right to control of our own seabed and fishing grounds. We might want to redress the billions of pounds that were extracted from our economy by the British Crown in mineral duties and income tax from 1765 to the early 20th century, and a bit later I have to add in certain cases. These may still be redressed if we had more politicians who actually understood both our history and our current situation. Yet I can't think of any MHK in many years who has seriously challenged the legitimacy of the United Kingdom's abuse of this island and its resources. Reading Hansard records of the Keys and Timbald meetings of the past 20 years 
makes me wonder what Ilium Doan risked and ultimately gave his life for. And with the current economic situation set to get a lot worse before it gets better, I fear more than ever for the future of this island and its people, for our children, for my children. Nonetheless, I believe there is still enough left for us to pull from the ashes something, but it will require a total rejection of the local authority and little England mindset of politicians and populace. In that respect, I am not so hopeful. Anyone who has read the Mount Murray report will know that our current Chief Minister does not react well to scrutiny and does not actually understand what is and is not proper in relations between government ministers and private enterprises. Nor is he the only one who is guilty of that. When aggressive building developers such as Dandara Stroke Heritage Homes write letters that accuse legitimate objectors of putting their employees at risk, I personally cannot trust the government bodies involved to adhere to their own rules. We have a health minister who has returned with less votes than would put most candidates in last place at an election. A clear case for electoral reform. Despite years of the Keys passing bills to reform the Legislative Council, the Keys continue to populate the body with members who block such reforms. The Legislative Council has an increasing number of members who have absolutely no political background, no stated manifesto and no accountability to the people. The news coverage of the conviction of Charles Lewin for attempted election fraud seemed to concentrate more on the cost of the process rather than the extremely unsavoury crime itself. Who is trying to say what here? Is there someone within power right now who is in some way discomforted by the exposure of this nasty episode? Was the exposure of former Chief Minister Donald Gelling's involvement in the puppet master cabal a source of discomfort for other unidentified string pullers? Who pulls their strings? Central figure in the issue, Mr Kevin Woodford, formerly known from appearances on TV shows such as Can't Cook, Won't Cook, <laughs> claimed that the episode had ruined his reputation on the island. I beg to differ. I don't have enough time to tell you about the misinformation disseminated by the department, formerly known as Tourism, about the bus driver's strike, except that they were willing to pay over £19 per hour to strike breakers rather than admit they had a problem. Nor do I have enough time to expand upon the belief that the multi-million pound re-equipping of our bus fleet is to provide a tasty off-the-shelf package for privatisation. Whilst most departments are desperate to save a couple of hundred thousand pounds here and there, the Department of Infrastructure has a seemingly bottomless pit of money to spend on low priority projects such as replacing perfectly functional roundabouts and relaying perfectly serviceable pavements with expensive and high maintenance block work versions. Let's make sure we have our priorities right. Forget education and health as long as we have pretty pavements and well kept roundabouts. But these are short term issues. What is and what should be the objective of the Manx people and the government here? To be an anachronistic tax anomaly of the United Kingdom, in fact England as things progress, or a nation with a future? Ilium Dawn was not a Republican. He did not advocate a return to sovereign independence. He was of a wealthy and powerful, powerful family in Manx terms and was probably content to maintain that position. When in extremely difficult circumstances, when others in his position could have easily flown with a fortune to lands completely remote from the turmoils of this English civil war, he chose to stay and do his best for his country. For that, some now choose to vilify him. Shame on them. Thank you.